somewhere in Oregon, a tree just hits an accident and hits a power line, and that causes a train of events. So that chain of events actually echoes across all the United States in that because you turned on your air conditioner and this short circuit happened, a transformer blows in Oregon. The load that's being distributed to Oregon from throughout the system is then re redistributed to other major hubs, and they've already overloaded because everyone there has turned their air conditioners on as well. So you have this excess energy here as well, so they fall over as well. And this propagates across the US until the system actually comes to some sort of stable equilibrium. We know this has happened. This has happened a number of times in the US. And the, the point of telling you this story, although it doesn't seem particularly well grounded in the area of sustainability, is that local actions lead to global phenomena. And that our local individual actions towards a particular response directly feed into and can cause new responses to happen that are in some way unpredictable from you just turning on your local switch. We've talked about global dynamics, and Will Steffen in his talk had a number of wiggly little lines representing temperature changes and so forth. This is a slide provided by Brian Walker, and it's a nice illustration. We can imagine that the dynamics of the world system is actually some sort of landscape, and that landscape has hills and valleys in it, and we have a little marble, and that marble represents the dynamics of the system, the current state of the system. And what you find is that this uh, marble actually just <coughs> rattles around some of these little valleys here, and it's quite happy. If it hits the bottom of valley and stays there, it's called in a state of equilibrium. But because the Earth and the systems we, we uh, interact with are open systems, they take energy in from the sun and so forth, and they actually don't exist in equilibrium, so they rattle around these, these nice little holes here. And what can happen is that through our individual actions, through the actions that we take and our decisions that we make, we can actually take our system out of one state and flip it into another. And then the system actually rattles around in this new form of state. These areas are called basins of attraction. And these are known also as stable states. These stable states can be things like a lake that has nice clear water, or it's alternative when we add nutrients to the water and pollution and so forth, that the, the, the lake becomes covered in algae. Interestingly, taking another slightly different view is that the dynamics actually live on what's called a manifold. And a manifold is just another way of saying a surface, really. And what happens is that as we add pollution, a nice clean lake up the top here begins to track down to a particular point. And when it hits this fold in the manifold, it actually falls off this surface and enters a new, new alternative stable state. This is called a flip. It's called a phase transition um, to a new state. And what you find is that if we want to get rid of this algae, what we have to do is actually force the system back. But we have to force it back well past our initial point where it initially, initially flipped from one state to another. This is called a hysteresis effect, and we saw this in Will's talk in the form of some buffering that was going on. So we actually need to include and still a lot of effort to move our, our lake back to a state, to a, a transition point where we'll actually jump back to the state it originally was. So while these systems can naturally buffer in one direction, you find that they actually buffer back in the opposite direction as well. Also, what we find is that our actions can actually change the shape of the landscape the ball's rattling around on. And what we know about this is that as we change that shape, we actually may be cutting, a, cutting off our ability to actually track back to our preferred stable state. As we go through a number of examples here, you can, you can see these transitions quite clearly. We can see transitions between grasslands and woody thickets. We can see transitions in productive farmland to arid wasteland, and even transitions in the way the, of, the, of the Earth dynamic. In that the Earth essentially has two stable states. It has one in the form of ice, the snowball Earth, another form is hothouse Earth, and somewhere in the moment, Earth is about here. It has ice in it, and you know, we're actually moving about this manifold. We can easily flip back down, if we had a particular type of perturbation, back to a snowball Earth state. Conversely, what we can do is actually continue tracking where we end up in a hothouse, hothouse state, where we have no ice and the temperature is substantially higher. These last few slides have just been illustrations of the sort of dynamics of tipping points and transitions. What I'd like to do now is just throw some spaghetti against the wall and sort of say, what are some of the tipping points that are around? Well, the first one is actually CO2 emissions. 
will also mention that CO2, the carbon, is only one of a number of elements that are on the hit list of potential problems. This is a set of data that is taken from the IPCC uh, report scenarios. And basically, over line, line on this is output from the uh, Global Carbon Project. What these scenarios show are particular CO2 trajectories, which can be translated into temperature changes. What we've, what we've found, which are these open circles here, is that observations about the Earth system show that our <coughs> CO2 emissions are actually tracking above any of the IPCC uh, 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 scenarios. Another major transition, and Graham Turner picked this up, was actually uh, population growth. <coughs> population growth is tipped to uh, reach about 8.5 to 10 billion people by the year 2050. That could change because population is a balance between birth rate and mortality. If we get better at using our drugs or we get better at medicine, we actually prolong people's lives, so this arrow will go up in this direction. If we continue to allow the Americans to indiscriminately use IVF to you know, create litters of children, the birth rate will actually go up as well. It won't plateau off as, as we're seeing. So there's another tipping point. Another tipping point is actually availability of water. This is a map which actually demonstrates levels of stre water stress throughout the world. And as you can see, there are certain areas that have no water stress and areas that are under high water stress. And Will's, Will's picture uh, demonstrating the flows of grains and so forth, or sorry, virtual water through the world is actually a very accurate map. We're exporting water from one location to areas where water is not, not as prevalently available. We also have a major tipping point here in India and Pakistan in that we have countries that are very highly stressed, but we have a country of India particularly whose five, sorry, Pakistan whose five major contributories actually start in India. Both countries have nuclear weapons and India plans to dam those five rivers. So work out what's going to happen there between those two countries that love each other already. This is another map demonstrating world food, world food trade. Green represents countries who are net food exporters. These other colours that were shaded actually represent countries that are net food <coughs> importers. The hashed area are those, those countries who the average person is under, or more than 20% population is undernourished. As you can see that there is a nice map between the water availability and the unfed, un undernourished and lack of those that have lack of food. Interesting to find, interesting data to throw against the wall here as well will be to overlay projections for changes in water distributions and very quickly we discover that um, Australia would no longer become a net food exporter but a net food requirer. The other topic I'd like to talk about here is dealing with something called increased complexity. I'm a natural wanderer as I give a talk and I'm fine, I'm trying to stay as close to the lectern as I can, I'm sorry. Complexity is a wonderful thing and I come from the CSIRO Centre for Complex System Science, that, pay, that pays the bills. Joseph Tainter came up with an interesting model for society and he basically said societies do things are collections of people who organise themselves in such a way to lever resources. And he came up with an interesting model where basically you have societies and they increase, a le they create complexity. And by complexity here I mean they create a road or they create a trade network or they create something else. And with that increase in complexity comes some net gain, some net gain. and that net gain can be an increased access to resources. Say, for example, uh, if we create a road, then we can all of a sudden begin to trade with our neighbours, and that road actually gives us access to neighbours. But because we have increased trade and we have increased resources, what we do is we actually increase our level of complexity again, and we add something else on top. But very soon we find that societies actually reach a point where they can no longer maintain the level of complexity. The structures that they've built become so complicated to maintain and the amount of cost required to maintain them outweighs any benefit you actually get from actually installing the next level of technology or next level of complexity. And what you find then after that point is that the next level actually starts to diminish your ability to access resources. So you actually find that it begins to collapse. This is, Tainter has actually gone back and studied the, a number of ancient societies and I believe uh, Graham Turner in the next talk will Elaborate, the, elaborate on this in more detail. This is the Mesopotamian society who are believed to have actually built, or they know they've built very large, very elaborate adobe-style buildings and had elaborate trade systems. 
but all of a sudden their, their civilization collapsed because they became too specialized, a small disturbance in the availability of water led to the collapse of the society. One of the things that is important in amongst all this, and this is a key, a key message from this slide, is something called a con sunken cost effect. A sunken cost effect is, can be best described as throwing good money after bad. I have um, a pretty ordinary car. I spent $1,500 replacing the engine. Now it needs something else. Where am I going to spend the next $50? Replacing, buying a new car or replacing the component which is in my ruined car, in my old broken down car? The answer is I will actually put it where I just put the last major investment in money. People are, people are hopeless at sunken cost, of, sunken cost problems. What we do is we'll build a major piece of infrastructure. If it doesn't work, well, we won't start again. We'll just reinvest the next level of a million dollars. When it doesn't meet our requirements, what we'll do is we'll invest another $10 million. Eventually, if we throw enough resources and make it complicated enough, it will work. We do this all the time, and it's a really hard cycle to break out of. And this kind of cost effect, when you reach a certain point, you actually fall off this level of complexity, and you actually begin to re receive a reduced return for any major investment in, in technology. We also see these sorts of boom-bust waves as well in the form of globalisation. Prior to the war, we actually received... We were, the world was in a state of, of globalisation or global trade that we've only just really uh, gotten back to. And the reason for this was that prior to the, prior to the First World War, we had uh, union movements were essentially banned. Uh, organisations were the major... Large companies were, were the major drivers of the economy. So what you have was this sort of globalisation to access resources quite, quite quickly. This followed by, came up followed by the war, we saw a collapse, and then we hit Will Steffen's magic number of the 1950s, and we see this level of globalisation taking off again. We also see an increased level of, of complexity about our world trade systems. This, sorry, our world transport systems. This is a map showing the structure of all airline systems in the, in the world. So basically you can jump on a plane, you fly into one of these mega hubs like I think that is Heathrow um, and then you can basically bounce anywhere else in the world. We're very good at building up these elaborate structures which make life seem easy for us <laughs> but it's just really another level of, of complexity on top of our already complicated system. Wherever we go as humans we love to trash the ecosystems that surround us. What we find is that Wherever we go, humans are replacing the top-level predators in any ecosystem, and as a result, the bottom-level predators are becoming thin. Sorry, the bottom-level level, um, elements of the system are becoming thinned out. So we're now reaching a level of extinction that dates back to somewhere about the Permian. Our level of impact is is that big. I think it's the second or third largest extinction level event, mainly because we continue to import new animals, new species, and I'll have another example of this in in a few slides. Some more global trends. This is a this is a, a map of world trade. This is the top traders or sorry top imports between countries in the world. Basically, what you see here is very elaborate structures, very heavily concentrated around the U.S. and China. Everything else is, tends to be around the periphery with minor exchanges going on. What you also note is in this is that every country no is sorry, just about every country isn't self-sufficient. We rely on imports to actually make our, our lives work. What's happened is a degree of uh, optimization has gone on where com countries have identified what can we do really well and they're focused in on those niche markets. And as a result, what they do is they export those niches to the rest of the world. Australia is a good example. I've described it as Australia is actually having a hollow economy. We have a lot of ability to actually dig great big holes and pull out iron ore and send it overseas. We have a fantastic capacity to actually wash and clean each other's sheets in the form of services. But we have very little transformational industry in Australia. We don't take our ores and make steel cars and then resell them on. We're very bi um, bimodally distributed in the way our economy is actually structured. This actually reflects that, where we have heavy imports focused around several hubs who can actually play the gamut of... Um, play the gamut of, of services required, the remainder actually require net importations in and exports to actually solve their um, economic shortfalls. I've just painted a series of, of slides that show that we possibly are leading to this point where we're going to end up with a reduced return for any major investment in technology that we're, that's going to come about. In his, pain, in his paper, Tainter listed seven... Um, Seven major ways of coping with complexity. I've only I've distilled that down to six. In that, I don't believe that the tainter's first option of sticking your head in the sand and ignoring the problem completely is uh, is a is a valuable option. 
I do believe that the first option, though, is doing nothing. It is a viable option. We just let the systems fall over and don't bother replacing them and start anew. That requires a significant shift from that sunken cost idea in that if something doesn't work, scrap it, start again. The remainders of, the, of Tainter's list are all about coupling any benefits you get from increased technology to the offset cost. So you need some sort of elaborate cost structure. And this is my last little slide here and the last little piece of thought on this idea about developing solutions to problems. I have no idea whether this story is actually true or false and I don't actually want to go and investigate to find out if it is true or false because I just think it makes it a lovely story. I'm going to take you on another trip so I've relieved you of being in, in Western United States so I'm going to take you to Fiji. Fiji is a wonderful place. It was, it was colonised by the British um, and the landhold, the plantation operators there imported slaves to grow various things and one of the things they wanted to grow were date palms but because date palms have a have a, a essentially a spin up time involved with them what they did was they actually imported the mature date palms so they could get a crop almost straight away the problem with that is that the along with importing mature date palms you imported rats so rats on Fiji had no natural predators so these things were quite happy and they thought they were in the land of the of the free and the willing and the land of the bounteous, so they went and multiplied like anyone's business, and as I, if I believe the story, um, the average Fijian was up to their eyeballs in rats before somebody did anything. So what they did was they say, well, in, in India, the, the rat's natural enemy is some sort of snake. The story says they imported cobras, so that's what makes me think this is not a true story. So they actually imported, imported a snake to actually try and eat the, eat the rats, but the, rat, the snakes found other things in Fiji more attractive than the rats, so it ate just about everything else other than the rats. So they said, well, now we're after eyeballs and snakes. What are we going to do about it? Well, we'll introduce mungies, and they did actually introduce mungies. I know that mungies are on Fiji. I don't know if this is the reason. They actually introduced the mungies to actually eat the snakes. Unfortunately, mungies like eggs as well, and there's a lot of bird life and so forth on Fiji. So the, the mungies went away and quite happily chomped away on the eggs and didn't actually worry about the snakes. They were just too hard to catch. So recently, they've introduced a small falcon, which is the natural predator of the mongoose, to try and actually thin out the layer layer of complexity. <laughs> I have the final solution. When this little beast here realises that there are more yummy things on Fiji to eat other than rats, snakes and, uh, and mungies, that we'll need to actually genetically engineer <laughs> something like the Velociraptor, I think, to actually, uh, to actually harvest, harvest out those small falcons. But this is the point of this story, and it's a nice little story, is that we actually suck at coming up with solutions to problems. We, we quite often see the quick fix, the here and now, and say, that's what I want. And when you start down a particular path, say, for example, building a piece of infrastructure, it doesn't work, you say, we'll just throw something else at it. We don't stand back from the problem and say, where is this all coming from, and how can we rethink what we're doing and come up with a better solution? Because we always seem to reach for the quick fix and the simple technological solution. In this case, we're reaching for the, you know, the, the holy grail here of biotechnology uh, meets... Uh, Jurassic Park meets whatever else. And on that note, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time, and I hope I, I haven't bored you all to tears. <laughs> so